Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this panel today and talking about uh, the future of television and film in the digital space. Uh, my name is Matt Hooper and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce my guests today. Um, to my left is Eric. Eric oversees, and I'm going to do the introductions somewhat quickly because their uh, credentials are immediately apparent. So on my left, Eric oversees uh, digital for Comedy Central, Spike, and TV Land, and has been doing so for the last six years, so he's very familiar with this space. Uh, Carl is the artistic director for SIF, the largest film festival in the world, also does something very similar for the Palm Springs Film Festival, and uh, has been in this industry for over 20 years, so has seen quite a bit of, of change. Um, to his left, Tom Skerritt. Tom is an actor and director. You've likely seen him in Picket Fences, Top Gun, Alien, many, many other films, and now uh, has, is bringing about a company that is going to have web series, digital content, and digital medium, so is on the cutting edge of that space. And then at the end here is Sheila Andreen. Sheila is the CEO and co-founder of IndieFlix, has been in the industry probably for a couple of decades now, I would guess, uh, knowing Sheila pretty well. And uh, IndieFlix has over 4,500 films in its library with worldwide rights to over 90% of them. So great panel, very qualified. Thanks for joining us today. And you'll see down to your right here, you should have a microphone that you can just grab if you need it. Um, so let's start the conversation out with rights, because rights are a mess. And uh, I'm just wondering, how do we unravel, and can you explain a bit about the, the kind of complicated web of rights between content owners, producers, you know, television stations versus digital space? How does that work? <laughs> Eric, I'll start with you. Wow. <clears throat> that could be the whole, the whole day, uh, let alone this panel. Um, you know, it's in, it, it, it is in, it's an evolution right now. You have a lot of old business models, whether that's Nielsen households, you know, a sample-based methodology, 80,000 people that are supposed to represent what everyone in America is watching on TV. That feels like an outdated idea for 2012, because it is, um, that we're still in a sample-based methodology, but that is how television is still transacted based on those ratings. Um, you have things like YouTube that is now based on a global rights system. Like they're going to acquire content. It's for a global rights. That's something that we have never, ever, ever done in sort of the traditional television media. Um, you have in the movie space, you know, you, all those fundamental questions about why can't I stream the movie I want to stream on Netflix. That has to do with pay TV deals that are 10 years long at times and lock up movies and windows. That So you have essentially consumer behavior that has shifted and will never shift back. You have some sobriety from Hollywood recognizing that that's true, and yet a system of rights and essentially measurement that is the same ones that have been in place for 50 years, and that are not only are they difficult technically to do, it would be difficult to track what you're watching at work, right? If you're watching The Daily Show from your office at work, it would be very hard to measure that. Um, but at the same time, there's almost a bit of collusion going on that says, but if we don't sustain the way these things have always sort of run, there are billions of dollars at stake, and people are definitely loath to put that at risk. So while there is, there's change happening and things are loosening up all the time to a degree, you still have some big behemoths that are basically the way that they've always been, and you know, it'd be difficult to guess when those are going to change, but I think consumer behavior is so shifted at this point that there's almost no choice but to change them. And Sheila, how is IndieFlix dealing with rights? It, I know you're on the cutting edge of kind of digital distribution for film. I think, um, Eric, you summed it up pretty well. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually a filmmaker, and so I came into doing what I do in a, from a different um, path, having trying to learn how to distribute my own content um, and seeing people, Lionsgate or artists, and wanting to take our films and tie up our rights and sell off territories. And it just seemed so complicated to me. It reminded me of all that I went through in licensing our music. And so what I learned in the festival circuit, we, we were basically like the Netflix of independent film, IndieFlix is. So we have almost 5,000 independent films from festivals around the world. And we have films that have not been picked up by Hollywood. So the rights are, are free and open. 
And so we basically um, joined forces with the filmmaker and licensed those rights to deliver globally. So we, 90% of our library is worldwide rights. So we kind of don't even mess with the standard distribution world of trying to partition and piecemeal every single territory to get money out of them. I don't even know how, I mean, when I tried to wrap my head around collecting money from Poland and Turkey and, and other countries, it was just, it was mind boggling. I felt like my whole job would be communication and relationships on just collecting the money after you spend all this time cutting the deal and delivering. So the great thing about technology is that now we can deliver globally and deliverable costs have come down. It's so much easier for the filmmaker to deliver their their content. Um, of course, there's new things always coming up to make create hiccups, but and did I answer the question? You did. It was great. <laughs> Thanks. I just uh, went around that whole process. It was, it was perfect. Um, Tom, Carl, you've both been in the film industry and, and been around film and television for a long time. And so from uh, that perspective, do you think that the, or, or do you personally find this emergence of web series uh, uh, to be more of an opportunity, to be more of a threat to traditional passive media? How do you view it and why? Uh, do you want me to start? Well, uh, I mean, I, I've been primarily involved on the exhibition side uh, with theaters and then with the festival. And for us, it's um, we've sort of operated outside that space of, of the rights because people are showing films with us as a festival in order to, as a platform, to gain value for the rights that they are going to sell or for the audience they're trying to reach. So um, it's been quite tricky for us to enter that space uh, without... Uh, the risk of devaluing a filmmaker's rights if they haven't sold it. So we haven't actually done much, um, for, but other festivals have. Tribeca has gone around that because they've actually bought the rights of films, but they've bought all of the rights. So, the, so they actually bought the theatrical as well as the VOD. And, and in, that, in those cases for feature films, and I'm primarily talking about feature films, they've, um, they've been able to manage that space where they're, they're using a theatrical release and using festivals to promote people watching them and the other sort of on the smaller screens where they're making most of the money. Um, there was a, there was a, but there was also an experiment at Sundance where they actually streamed them during the festival uh, for certain films that, uh, that were the most independent films, and then all the buyers basically overlooked those movies because they thought that they had lost their value. So, and that was a few years ago, and, and then the dynamic is, is changing, so that's not as much the case now, but um, uh, that's, I don't know, it's, it, for me, that's it's for us. It's interesting to see how we we have to maintain our relevance in terms of what we can offer films and filmmakers, so that they can they can fully exploit their rights and they and we can be uh, we can help them, and so we can provide that space where people can get awareness of a film. So then, whether they see it on the small screen or the big screen, uh, you know, they'll um, it will increase their their so sort of the marketability, I guess you could say. Uh, well, I. <sighs> would have to speak from 50 years of being in the business and seeing it's changed quite a bit. Um, always a narrative guy. Storytelling is the heart of everything we do. It's in each one of our lives. And if ever we want to tell a story, we have to believe it's really worthwhile telling. And that gets down to self-worth, which is what we are teaching at the film school, basically the validity of your own life, your own point of view, the own very special gift of your own experiences are really the best thing you can bring to narrative. Um, that said, with the film school, which needed to be done because screenwriting had to improve here because this city has more young people shooting film than anywhere else, um, many, of that, many of those films are not really <laughs> what they should be or could be because they haven't taken the time to work on the material to make it to the point where it's worth someone giving you the money to do it. Um, but we have the potential here to be to Hollywood what Toyota has been to General Motors of the American auto industry. So um, it's that notion that's kind of carrying me into a whole other area of thinking about narrative film itself as narrative storytelling, the usual two hours in a movie. We'd like to make that two hours 
with your time rather than have being, having the daylights scared out of you. Most of them are all shock and awe. But um, we're seeing the value in web series now. And as a matter of fact, as a writer, um, I'm very excited about the potential of web series. I, a writer can write anything he or she wants to do and put it out in the web. There's no, there's nothing, it's a, just the table is clean. One of the things that you alluded to, Eric, was about the uh, standards that have been, the way of thinking that's been in Hollywood. For a long time, it's hard to get let go of. There's an awful lot of money invested in it to make the kind of change that's, that can be done by, a, say, a Toyota, as we can be, uh, can't be made as quickly as we can do that here. So I'm really of the belief that since we do have a clean table, we don't have creative bookkeeping that, how, that Hollywood tends to have when you're doing a feature, as I've done in a couple of cases where I've deferred salary for a considerable sum of money, never to see that possibility. That's a whole other story, I won't get into that. But here, if, you have a film, if you're a filmmaker and you defer your salary, as in the case of Indieflix, you're gonna be able to click it up every night and see what the revenue is, your own share in the revenue. And that's pretty exciting. Uh, that's not something that Hollywood can do in a hurry. So uh, I, I'm just very excited about the potential of the web series, quite frankly. And so let's say I'm a, a young filmmaker or I want to be in television and I want to start a web series. Um, two questions as to that. One, how do I go about doing it? And two, how do I monetize it? Which may be the most important web series or, or film. I mean, I guess that's the biggest question. I'm not going to take the first part. I'll let somebody else take that. But I think the, the second part is the most interesting part. And it's also the part that, in effect, we're talking broadly here, web series or YouTube content or whatever, however you want to generalize it. The biggest influence I would say it's ultimately had on what you see on television is probably not creatively shaping the way shows are, although Tosh.0 looks like a YouTube show on some level. But more to the point that it's turned everybody whose talent on TV has to be a marketer because YouTubers are the greatest video marketers there are. The only way anybody's gonna watch that web series is if you market it yourself or you have serendipity, you ride some wave in a news cycle. Like, you can make parody videos, you can do all that stuff, but essentially you have to market yourself. And the guys who've made it, the big YouTubers, right, the Freddie Wongs and the Ray William Johnsons are shameless self-marketers, and that's what's driven them to five million subscribers, four million subscribers on YouTube. It's also made them incredibly brand friendly because they're intrinsically marketers themselves. And so now when we're looking to sign people to do television shows, one of the big differences is the primary, especially in a world where on television there's a lot less promo time, you guys are all using DVRs, you skip the commercials, you skip the promos, you don't know what our new shows are. We're requiring, not requiring, although we're starting to require in contracts, but we are relying on talent to be the number one marketer of their own programming. And that if you are the talent in the show, you are now expected not to do one day of press and one day of promos, but to be constantly creating more content in the promotion of your show. And that's a lesson directly learned from the YouTube generation, if you will. And in the film space as well, uh, there's, there are new systems for monetization that I, as, as far as I understand it, that IndieFlix and other models are using. What, what sorts of things are those, Sheila? Well, can I just comment, just a piggyback on Eric's comment about, I, I, I didn't realize that you know, more standard distribution uh, requires that as well. I mean, beyond the press junkets. That actually makes me, I'm thrilled to hear that, although it makes me, as if when I put my filmmaker hat on, I think to give up my rights um, and then also be on the hook and responsible for having to be out there marketing and being a brand in myself so that so that the network or the, you know, the production company can make all the money, a distribution company can make all the money before I get paid. But I'm not saying directing that exactly at you. I'm just the old model. <laughs> um, but because we require that as well, and we deliver, you know, shorts, features, documentaries, web series, 
Um, and I, I created a new model called the RPM model, which is a, a new form of payment. It's very different than the CPM model, the pay-per-view model, and the straight licensing deals, um, which I'm, we've, we're just starting to um, announce now, and it's very exciting, but uh, removes all the gatekeepers. But it does require that the filmmaker essentially be a brand and market themselves. And you know, we look for content as well to showcase of filmmakers, not just good stories or timely content, um, has to have played a film festival, although we make exceptions, but really someone who's really good at marketing themselves. It's important that filmmakers today also start branding and building their audience at the point of conception when they're starting to um, create the content and create those relationships with brands early on so that you can tap into those communities to help launch your product when it's ready. We use films, f film festivals as launch pads to you know, screen it bigger than life, have an audience, have an offline experience where you can connect with people, and then hopefully they become your ambassadors or evangelists, and they can go out and then help drive people back to the online platforms where you can monetize it. So, so taking that into account, the, you know, looking at the last, let's say, six years, since 2006, every single year, if you were to take the top three films at the box office and compare them to the top video game sold, the top three films at the box office that year are less than the top video games sold for that year. So there's, there's a trend pushing towards interactive content. And so I guess my question would be, and, and Tom, you've been in the industry and, and seen a lot go on for a long time, do you think that traditional passive media, and, and then I'll turn it over to everybody else, do you think traditional passive media is dead or going the way of the dinosaurs and interactive media is going to soon usurp that and become the media of the future? Well, that's a pretty good question. Uh, I don't think there's any clear answer for that. I think you cannot get rid of the past. Uh, we are all products of our history, as uh, any industry is the product of that industry, and there's always going to be that influence. It's how, how you pick and choose that which works from you, for you from the, you, from the past. Um, we don't know quite how the new face is going to look yet. It's still with the plastic surgeon, and uh, and the design is, is still going on. There's so much changing, so much. But my what excites me most is we live in a city that has the clarity. As I said earlier, the table is clean for us. We don't have that. We don't have the past that the American auto industry had or that Hollywood has had the standards that have been set, uh, some of which are changing dramatically right now. It, we have just a complete, we have a complete clear picture upon which we can build whatever we want to do, knowing that we have this rich past to draw on. Uh, we're going to, once we get understanding how good we are up here, <laughs> Um, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, that this is the one the best place to live in America. I didn't mean to be part of the Chamber of Commerce here, but that's based, the basis of my thinking. That we have, as I said earlier, a very successful music industry here, a very sec successful technology. Now it's time for this new media uh, to emerge, embracing all of these issues, all of these things that are successful here. In a way, they, they don't really work in the old model. And Eric, do you think, I mean, what are your thoughts in the television uh, space? Is television a dead medium? Is it no, shifting? No, I mean, you know, I don't, the, your, your, your comparison to the box office is accurate, right? Um, I do think there's a difference between immersive entertainment, which is what I would call video games, and like interactive narrative. The, the, since I get, you know, my first digital job was in 1995 in Bellevue. And since I, got, since I took that job, there's two ideas that never die, and they're always being chased. One of them is the choose-your-own-adventure sort of narrative adventure interactive space, and the other one is like, you know, it's always told as you're watching Friends, and I want to buy that sweater, and then you can buy that sweater right off the TV. And people keep trying to get at both those ideas again and again and again, and I'm not honestly sure that either of them will ever ultimately come to pass. Immersive entertainment, like wanting to be a first-person shooter or pretend that you're James Bond or whatever, 
you know, A, very, very, very few video games have ever worked that were based on existing IP. Some argue that only two video games in the history of video games have ever been successful in the, in, with existing IP. Batman Arkham Asylum and Goldeneye, and that's it. And every time they try and do a video game from a movie, it fails. Like, literally, right down the line. They never work. There's something about, like, that, because that's a fixed storyline. There's something about that was told one way, yes, you may want to immerse yourself in Star Wars or whatever, but even those things have never really gotten to the level of a Halo or a Call of Duty or any of the gigantic sort of video games of the moment. Um, and I feel like it's an idea that seems like it should always work, the choose your own, own adventure thing, but I'm not sure that that's ultimately going to influence what film and television are. I do think that video games will keep getting better. There will be more narrative to them, but they're still about sort of a visceral, interactive, experience more so than they are about changing the storyline of what happens. And so maybe I'm cutting a line that's a little too fine, but I think both will continue. I think narrative is going to continue. I think you're going to see it. I think some of the traditional things, the duration, even when we say web series, everybody in your mind goes like, well, they're all four or five minutes long. It doesn't have to be four or five minutes long. In fact, if anything, I feel like what's one of the trends of recent times is binge viewing. Right, and there's more, we have, we have more of a sense now that if we're gonna put up a web series, we're just gonna put the whole thing up. Like why are we trying to hold it to some scheduled model of the past in an on-demand yeah. universe? Um, and in our world, I mean, the thing that we have to wrestle with is not only are people, you know, changing where they watch it, but they're just not watching live, you know? Nobody, you know in this room, right, how many people watch live television in the last three or four days? Probably maybe you know, other than news coverage, right? They're the reasons that you might watch, but the shows you love, like, yeah, maybe you watch Homeland on Sunday night, but I mean, it takes like a creative level that's so incredible that you can't, literally can't wait until the next episode comes. And guess what? Very few shows are gonna clear that bar. The rest of them you're gonna sort of binge view on Netflix or watch them on DVR. Um, and that's fundamentally changing the way that television's operating. So like the, the control by the user may not be about controlling the story, it's gonna be about controlling the consumption. I have to say absolutely, and I think part of the issue is, and I don't want to get into education, but imagination is sorely lacking in a society right now, and immersion that you we're talking about requires a certain amount of imagination. I don't think people have the confidence to let their imagination go to that extent that they're going to be entertain themselves. Uh, it'd be very perverse to do so, but uh, this whole degradation of imagination enhancement programs over the last 30 years I think is a major issue that we cannot keep talk about separately from what we're doing here because uh, this idea of leading people is is the best thing we can consider because we're the people with the imaginations we're the people who dare to put our foot down on the floorboard and, and go with it and what the hell let's just do it and try to move it forward move things forward uh, that's the imagination. It's just pushing the limits of all of this. And uh, that's where I don't think immersion, I have to, have to totally agree with you, but it's just specific to these, these imagination enhancement programs being taken out over the last 30 years out of the education. And we have some great leaders in the community working to bring content here and to drive the content base in the city. Not only Seattle's Film School, Tom, what you're doing, but James Keblis, who I saw earlier from the mayor's, I'm sorry, from, I say the mayor's office all the time, but the Seattle Office of Film and Music, and uh, Amy Lillard from Washington Filmworks. My question is, do you think Seattle will ever become a, a mecca for production, a, a new Hollywood, or are we always going to be on the technology side? And is it better that we stay on the technology side? It's both. It's all going to come together. Music, technology, and digital or film. Uh, and there's every reason to believe that we can. We have to understand that we can. Secondly, we have to believe in that. Carl, what do you think? You've seen a lot of filmmakers come through this region. Do you think Seattle is going to be the content creator of the future, or do you think we're going to be a technology side? Well, I think the, the te technology has allowed the possibility for Seattle to become more of a player in, in the creation of content that people see. And uh, one shining example is, is uh, Lynn Shelton and, and her films. Um, she's you know, been quite successful uh, and in, in, with each film that she's done, and they've been uh, seen around the world. They even, uh, you know, her, the film that she made here was even remade, uh, uh, Hump, Hump Day was even uh, remade as a French film by a French filmmaker, which you know never happens. So the culture of Seattle uh, and and the, is uh, 
Yeah, Yvonne et al., uh, and I saw it, it's, it's almost shot for shot, ex exactly the same, except it has you know, a French joie de vie. So it's a little bit different, but um, same story. It's sort of, it's very odd to watch. But no, so it's, it's technology is, is allowed uh, filmmaking to happen here, and people live here and work in that. So we just need to uh, be able to create better stories. And so it's really, it comes back to the, the story is where it originates. And if you can tell a great story, it doesn't matter where it is, and if, you, if we have more people telling great stories here and choosing to live here and work here, then uh, that will happen. I don't want to make too big an example out of something like Maker Studios, which is in Culver City in LA, but you know, one thing that the, the, the ubiquity of access to YouTube, one thing that it's done is it's created you know, across, there's even a whole theory, somebody was saying like dancing has gotten better. Why is dancing better? Because people now get to see the best dancers on YouTube, so kids start earlier and they now become better dancers because you get to see all kinds of things you never see. So clearly YouTube spawns imitators and anybody who has kids in junior high or high school has seen them start to make their own videos and want to post them and do stop motion animation. Like it is inspiring because it's so within reach to all. You just have an incredible you know, groundswell of people who now see themselves as content creators and, and they're posting content up. When those guys graduate up, there's still this allure of like, okay, now I just got a million video views, right? As a one-off. Now I'm starting to get a million video views. I've done it five times. And what Maker has done is sort of say like, we're gonna set up a community and an infrastructure in a place that literally is like, how about if all those guys all around the country and all those women all around the country all come to the same place and do the same thing? And we'll give them the infrastructure to do it and we'll take a cut of the revenue off what it makes on YouTube. But people, you know, I think what, what Hollywood sort of underestimates is there really was no, there's no such, I mean, there are working actors, to be sure. There's very few working filmmakers. Like, yeah, I, I comfortably make, you know, $80,000 a year as a filmmaker. Like, nobody, you either sort of, it's hard to be that person. But on YouTube, you can get to the point where there's going to be a lot of people who are like, I could stay at Best Buy in St. Paul, or I could move to... Culver City and work out at Maker Studios and make seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars. I'm doing it. Yes, absolutely. And there's no reason that piece, that infrastructure piece, couldn't exist here, because you've got on top of it this technology sort of, you know, the support of the companies that are here and sort of the intrinsic part of Seattle that's much more of a technology center than LA is ever going to be. And if you can mix that with the creative and sort of give people that destination, like that doesn't have to be in LA. Of course, there's a still there's no getting around the allure of Hollywood. It is still real and it's still happening, but that can be replaced with other advantages that could be born out here. And all those short form content makers are gonna graduate, just like there was a whole generation of guys who made music videos who then became the next David Fincher, the next generation of movie directors. It's gonna happen that those YouTube guys are gonna graduate and start producing TV shows and movies. So I think it could happen in Seattle, but somebody has gotta intend it. We've actually, our demographic in the, with our filmmakers is the 18 to 25 year old males. We're getting a lot more films submitted by that age group because they are savvy, they're sophisticated, they care tremendously about story. They're great at telling interactive stories where the audience wants to engage and, and guess how it ends as opposed to sort of surrendering and being passive and listening to Can I give you an interesting stat? Yeah. Since the beginning of the broadcast, I was telling you this, beginning of the broadcast year, so when the new shows came out for broadcast beginning of September, from last year to this year, men 18 to 24, it's like 15% of them just disappeared. They just stopped watching TV. And then, now again, you're talking about in the Nielsen sample, that's a very, very small number of people representing millions and millions of people. But young men just stopped watching TV to the tune of 15% of what they watched the year before and it's probably not coming back. It's interesting. Right, so they're off, you know, they're playing video games, they may be doing other things, but they're not, they're just not on well, TV Well, and I think anymore. they're making, uh, I mean, I don't I know they that are. they're all making content, but they're making content and they want to monetize it. Yeah. They don't just want to put it up for free on YouTube, they actually are going to paid platforms to submit it, and it's good stuff. And it's not just for their own demographic, it is for, you know, a wide range of audience. So it's, that's really exciting when you see films coming in that are made by even a 16-year-old or a 19-year-old, and, or they're still in school and these films are wonderful. And it, for me, I don't care about the running time because I don't need to fit into sure. 24 minutes or 44 minutes. Um, we're, we, we don't care about running times. We can, people can watch whatever they want. And now that we've launched channels, people can create their own channels and you can share them or make them public or private. And um, we just, we play by a whole set of 
different roles. So there's been a, a, a rise over the last, I don't know, about six to 10 years in, in the concept of transmedia, the idea of one platform or one, one piece of content being in comic books and film and you know, television and what have you. Um, do any of you work with any uh, transmedia you know, sort of projects? And, and if you do, um, what is your experience in the, in the impact and influence of this new digital media on transmedia? Well, Lance Weiler, who is um, a filmmaker and pretty well known in the transmedia space, um, he did a film that went to Sundance and it was, I think Sprint gave, a, I don't know, like 50 phones that were shared throughout different, you know, the people at, running around at Sundance and you got a message on it and you looked at it and he had a film called, um, oh my God, I want to say it's, I can't remember the name of it, but it was basically about a, a, a disease that was infecting everybody. And you got a message on your phone and you had to look at it and it was, okay, your husband's at the door or your spouse is at the door and they're infected, are you gonna let them in? You need to answer right now. You had like five seconds to answer and you had to answer it. And then it would ask you another question and, you, and then you pass it on to someone else. And the CDC, I guess, got involved and they were tracking all of the answers that were coming in through these phones, and there were all these screens up in this special you know, space, one of the buildings that tracked how this infection spread throughout the world. Um, and it became part of his movie. And so it was, you know, that's sort of a quick nutshell example of a, of a transmedia project that actually you're participating in the outcome of the film. Um, I think you needed to raise more money to completely finish it. And I know it's part of the Sundance Lab, so I don't know where it is right now, but if you Google Lance Weiler and Sundance Labs, that project will come up. But there's all kinds of um, really cool examples of transmedia. Some people look at it as a form of storytelling, and some people look at it as a form of marketing. I think it's a bit of both. Yeah, we, more in the low road version of that, but I, it's become clear to us that if you want to make a television show that's going to air on Comedy Central, you cannot limit yourself to making 22 minutes, 10 episodes, put it in the can, walk away. You know, beyond that you also need to be the marketer, now the amount, because, because so much of the marketing is going to come through content. If you want those people that you were alluding to earlier to be ambassadors, they're not going to retweet marketing messages. They will reshare content. So the need for content has just grown tremendously, and it, that affects things like production schedules and production budgeting and, well, shit, the show's been in the can for 10 weeks, but how do we do something timely this week? So, you know, for every show now, pretty much, I mean, some scripted shows, everything comes in a different flavor, some reality show, some competition show, not everything's the same. But for us, if we don't have a bulk of additional content that is meant, not just the redistribution of the same asset to somewhere else, but if we don't have workaholics making a Tumblr blog, and that Tumblr blog is very specific to that audience, and what we, and what we do on Instagram is different than what we would put up on the website, and what we would post on Facebook. It's not just about light up every platform with the same content, but essentially you've got to build your audience in an ongoing, like in constantly, in, you know, some talent is like, I don't want to make that much. I don't want to be in that relationship. And we're saying like, the only way this is going to work is if you're in a relationship. You've got to interact, you've got to create content at that level. So for us, like the definition of a TV show is starting to change. So we'll, we'll have an instance where something like on Tosh, you know, Tosh, the, you know, he does like a 1.7, 1.8 rating, so it's like two and a half million people watch the show. Then two million people come to the blog every week, which is nothing but more new content that's not in the show. And Tosh will actually get higher traffic out of season than he gets in season, which is like unheard of for a TV show. But it's because of all the additional original Tosh content that's there, not the, you know, versus like the Daily Show, which is completely about watching the show that was on last night. So more and more, we, you know, it's almost like, I'm not sure, it's coming into green lighting decisions. Like if this show doesn't lend itself to making additional content on an ongoing basis, if this show doesn't lend itself to a relationship between the characters and the talent and the audience, I'm not so sure it's the right show for us anymore. So let's say we're sitting here uh, 10 years from now and, and we're having a conversation very similar to this. We're a little bit older, but uh, I, I'm just, I, I'm curious, where, where do you think we're, the, the, we're going to be at 10 years from now in so much as 
web series and, and online media and digital distribution systems, do you think television will still be here? Do you think film will still be here? Where, where do you think we're going to be 10 years from now? I think film and television will still be here. I mean, I, I think we've done a tremendous amount of growing in the last seven years. And I think at some point we're going to slow down just a little bit because we kind of have to take a break. It's a little bit fast. Um, I think television is a staple in our lives. It's a utility. I don't think we could even exist without it. And I think some, you know, we're programmed to watch certain things in our living rooms. Granted, I think they'll be internet capable, so we'll have control over what we watch. But I think television will always be around. And from what Eric is saying, which I love hearing, is that, you know, video hasn't killed television. It's evolved television. It's made it so that it can survive. I think. We'll always have films. Where are you going to go on a date? I mean, you can't just always bring someone home. Plays. You, know? yes. you want to be in. a play. You want to be in public. You want to be somewhere, you know. And you, we want those screens bigger than life. We can't all afford to have them in our living rooms. And I think, um, you know, web series will find their role in our lives. And I think I do think we're breaking the time barriers. I think short films are going to have their day because we don't have a lot of time. I. Watch my, I mean, movies are my living, and I don't have time to watch feature films. And, um, I mean, gosh, planning to go to a movie is like planning a vacation for me almost. I, I like short films. I feel like I, they're like good appetizers. And I think web series are like, you know, great little mini appetizers on an episodic, you know, show that you can invest in. Um, I think it's all about the story. And um, I'd like to think, see things slow down just a little bit. We've... I mean, the iPhone came out in 2007. Netflix streaming started in 2007. Like, we've just done a tremendous amount of growing, and I feel like we're at warp speed. We need to dial it down, slow it down, figure out how brands are going to be incorporated into our content and our marketing and our funding as well, and just you know, get back to telling stories and connecting. Storytelling. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's hear it, Tom. <laughs> Oh, well, it's the fabric of society, I keep saying, and, and without it, uh, and it's de de degenerating quite a bit because of the way the media is handling it uh, or mishandling it. One interesting thing is about all this, I read about all these wonderful technological advancements, very little about content, development of content, um, which I think is affecting Netflix to some extent and some of the other some of the other channels that rely on film content supplying uh, comes supply and demand issue. Uh, I, I could certainly see the, the demise of the neighborhood theater, and that's already happening. But interestingly, also is that multimedia is basically for the same demographic that these slash and burn, shock and awe films coming out of Hollywood. I made for, and there's this huge, vast audience over 37. I think most of us sitting here are, are talking about that, right? We're, we're that audience. There's a lot of us that would love to have good narrative storytelling. I was just thinking about Downton Abbey, which uh, several grown-ups had, <laughs> let me put it that way, it told me about this. It says you got to watch this, and I've been. I you get hooked on it because it's beautiful. It has everything narrative film should have: gorgeous, beautiful scenery, wonderful, rich, intelligent characters, flawed characters, not so flawed characters. Episode after episode after episode that makes you want to come back and view the next episode, which is key to it, is that you have to, no matter how long or short it is, you have to terminate that particular episode or time period with that thought of, oh, I've got to see what this is, what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And that can happen on web series. There, web series is just another form of narrative tell, story, storytelling. Because if you've written Kabbalah ah, web series together, you can sell it as a movie over in Europe, which I think is a lot of what the intentions are, until they can be, uh, ju really judiciously monetize it with commercials that are not intrusive, that become part, almost a character in the storytelling, a character that can be laughed at, 
really, I would love to see products laugh at themselves a little bit more. Um, you remember them. I, I was, I don't mean to go on a little bit, but there was a film done recently that I, uh, called Ted, and it had this uh, celebrity where the, the, uh, act, the actors were saying, see, uh, showing out to somebody, said, I, see, I know this actor, and it, it would show them with this, this actor. And, um, and this actor cases, was Tom Skerritt, by well, the way. My photo with Tom but Skerritt. What, what, that's what the... struck me about that was uh, this is product placement in its best sense that you have some kind of silly presentation of this person or this product so that you're anticipating it coming back again so you can have another laugh. Yep. But it's the best way to remember a product, is it not? To do it in, not in an insulting way, but just have it have fun with the product. So you're think, so so we're talking about you know the emergence of better and smarter product integration and brand integration. Well, yeah, certainly monetizing in that fashion. That's one way to go about it. Yep. Uh, Carl, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, well, I just hope people are still going to see movies in theaters in ten years, which I think they they will be because it's, it is about the story and it's and it, for us it's always been about the experience because uh, we actually reopened a neighborhood movie house. Uh, last year, and we've, and, and over just the last year, we brought over 140,000 people through the doors, which is uh, going against the grain of what uh, is happening industry wide. But it's because we're creating experiences, we're giving people a reason to come to, out of their house. And I do want a place to go on a date, uh, other than my my living room, because I think people still want to go out of their house and uh, they still want to do things. So it's 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 more of a question: how to use new new technology, transmedia, and other methods to 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 build that audience and to bring them out for us. Uh, and also, there's ways we can connect. Uh, we can, if filmmakers can't be there in person, they can they can connect through the. They can be at the theater with the audience. They can see the audience in the theater, and they can talk with them through you know just using the simple technology of Skype, which is a very inexpensive um, a means to do it. But we that's how we can bring filmmakers from around the world that uh, aren't able to come here uh, and speak directly to the audience. So I'm I'm hopeful that, uh, um, and I'm basing our our business plan on the fact that people are going to still be going out to the theater, and, uh, but I do know that we need to use technology and new methods in order to get them there. And alcohol. They, they, will, yes, go, uh, yes. they will go. <laughs> One thing, bear in mind, you, know, you guys live SIF. You're subjective. I'm objectively yes. telling you. <laughs> it's an extraordinary experience, and there's no other place to go in this world that I know of that you're going to see films that nobody will ever see anywhere else, films from all over the place. This is not just a neighborhood theater that you reopen, which is, I don't know if a lot of you may know, what was, what was the original name of the theater up there? The, the, the Uptown. Uptown and a Neptune both closed. These guys took it over. But this is SIF. It's not standard movie go release. It's a different psychology. But at the same time, we're, we opened Argo, and, and it's opening everywhere. And what did we do? We had a, on the opening night, we had a red carpet. We had a fake movie premiere, and we actually challenged some uh, people. To, we challenged people to actually make their own Argo, and then we showed the best one as part of the opening presentation. And then we also had a Canadian Appreciation Day where we gave you know, flags and thanks to Canadians for, <laughs> for um, saving Americans. So interactivity, though, even in the passive media, is forcing things to become more creative. And, yes. And so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we just can't, you can't just show a film. You have to be think outside the box in order to make it work. Okay, and Eric? I was just, I mean, I agree with it, whatever, everything's been said today. I also think it will, 10 years time, you're gonna see much more self-funded, whether it's from big, big yeah. stars and people you know, or whether it's a Kickstarter model. At all levels, I think you're gonna see people exchange, they want control, and they're gonna take it back, and the way they're gonna take it back, even if they're big, rich movie stars, is to do it themselves. And there are too many examples already of that working and spinning out incredible, not only fantastic work, but incredible profits for those people. And I think that model is taking hold at all levels of entertainment, not just at the low Kickstarter level for agree, a coffee yeah, roaster. Great. I will say, though, I mean, I know we have to wrap up probably, but one of the things that I've learned, and I, st I, I don't know the answer, is that we, we now have the ability to... You know, let's write a great story and let's, okay, now we can get it on every screen on the planet. But it doesn't mean that anyone's going to watch you or anyone is going, you're going to make any money. So we still have, like, bigger things to figure out. And that's where I think we should start really, I mean, yes, we can do more marketing and we can do more social networking. We can brand ourselves and get our fans at, through Kickstarter and self-funding and all these things. But I think there's still a lot more work to be done on that whole sort of piece of our industry. So we have a few minutes left. Um, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Oh, sir. Uh, Celia, you're, you're, 
this is, you were just about to start what my question is about, and that is curation. I mean, with all of this explosion of content and the fact that we don't trust Hollywood or the TV stations to tell us, you know, to deliver quality anymore, where are we going to get uh, quality curation that we can trust that, going that, forward? That's a question I always um, I ask all the time because I'm, like, I'm not the person on iTunes. I don't like the top 25 songs. They're, I don't know who, you know, it's not my demo, it's not me. So I have to go find them on my own. I find Spotify and Pandora to be a lot more effective for me to find content, so I look to those platforms. And so we actually created channels and we'll be launching, I'm hoping to announce it at AFM next week, um, that we'll have um, customized channels where users can actually uh, create their own channels based on what they've watched and liked and reviewed and that kind of thing and then make them public or private and start sharing. I think the audience has evolved. I mean, we as, as, as audience and um, cons you know, consumers, we are so much more sophisticated. We have a, you know, Downton Abbey's a great example. I mean, television, I think, is awesome. I go to the movies and I can barely remember half the time what I just saw, except, of course, if I'm at SIF. Um, <laughs> but when I'm watching television, I mean, there's so many great shows, Homeland, Good Wife, I mean, there's, but it's all relative, right? Our, it's all, what, what do you like? How old are you? What, what, what's relevant to you? So I, I think the audience needs to have a little bit of say in some of the curation. I, I would only throw in, when we go talk to our audience, you know, we're, we're focused on men 18 to 34. When we go talk to them and we do focus groups and ethnographies and we go in their houses, like, they, you know, the line, the line of the year that came out of those guys is they go, if it's important, it will find me. And they basically believe that through what they're following and what's being fed to them, primarily through Facebook and Twitter, but through YouTube and elsewhere and what they subscribe to, that essentially, yes, the glacier has to melt at some point for the water to go downstream, but they believe that that network is wide enough, essentially, that that's become the filter. And that if that show's funny, someone's going to tell me about it. I'm going to see a clip shared. Like, it's going to get to me. And they've literally stopped seeking. They don't search. They're not really bookmark searchers on the web anymore. It just flows through to them, and that's what guides them, and that's become the curation. Do we have time to answer one more question? OK, one more question. Yeah. Back there, yep. Hi, yeah. Um, so I guess there's been a lot of talk about Downton Abbey. And um, I personally, you know, I really like web series. I like sort of well-produced, um, well-written, like small budget projects. But I also really love, especially about American television, like these shows that are um, kind of epic. Uh, and they really can only be executed by spending a lot of money. And so... How do you see these shows continuing in a like an environment where um, we're constantly like segmenting and um, getting smaller and smaller and more and fewer less revenues coming through like traditional advertising uh, and going out into the web? Like, how can we still maintain and produce some of these like beautiful, amazing shows like Downton Abbey and Mad Men and Homeland and you know all of these? productions that we like so much? Well, I, I used to think like that, actually. <laughs> I used to think that the only way you were going to have a beautiful, high production value movie was to spend a lot of money. And what I'm learning now is that you don't. I mean, I've seen amazing, beautiful films that were made for $12,000. Or, I mean, no, you may not have the famous movie stars of the world in your movies, although I think that, to Eric's point, it's changing a little bit. You might actually get some of those people in. Um, but I, 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 I actually don't think that that is a big stumbling block. I've seen lots of films that they did collaboration through the internet on special effects for sci science fiction films, um, and the quality is tremendous. I think technology has allowed us to create beautiful films um, for a lot less money, and I think it's, that's a fallacy. I, th I, th I think the other thing, if, you, if we were doing this conference five years ago, or six years ago, or whatever, I do think one of the themes would be like, but everyone wants everything for free all the time. Like that sentiment, that notion that in a sense you're never really going to find a way to monetize, I think it's, it's not gone, but it is faded to a degree. 
And Netflix is proof of that, and Hulu Plus is proof of that, and lots of things are proof of that, that people are, there is a willingness to pay. Now whether, you know, it becomes difficult to compete when it's like a $9 all you can eat, everything that's, you know, your perception of everything, although obviously many things you want to see are not there, both things you don't know and things you do know. You know one, one thing Netflix has figured out is you can obfuscate a lack of content by creating an amazing experience, and people are willing to pay for it. Um, and as long as there's enough satisfiers there, the gaps get sort of overlooked. But I, my, I, to your point, I hold some you know, hope that in Kickstarter shows there is a willingness to pay. It is not a free-for-all, everything for free, I'm going to pirate everything, I'm going to bit torrent everything, and that's the only way I'm going to consume content. I think that shift alone is just a positive one for the answer to that question going forward. Well, thanks, Eric. And thanks to everybody up here today, and thank you to you for coming out today to this panel. Uh, so I think that that's our time, so uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, everybody. Thank Have you, a great everyone. Day. Thank you.